You jibber jab, bamboozle, nuka, noozle, pippity pop, she called. You jibber jab, bamboozle, nuka, noozle, pippity pop, she called. I mean, you keep on talking, but you don't know where to turn it off. Welcome to the weekend. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. You're watching Independent Thinking. This is the Caldera Liberty Pen. It is a retractable fountain pen. Have you ever seen such a thing? It came from coloradopen.com. It's the best thing ever. No one in the world has such a cool pen, except this guy just pulled it out of his pocket. What the <laughs> hell? John, we're cut from the, the same, same cloth, cloth here. My favorite pen, blue ink, blue, blue color, ink. Blue uh, ink. retractable point. What more could but a person But it's a fountain want? pen. It <laughs> is the mixture of form and function. <laughs> Absolutely. All we right. write smoothly. Terry Anderson's from PERC, the uh, Property and Environment Research um, uh, Center. Account Center. Council Center, whatever, up in Bozeman, Montana. Now, lots of times on this program, I've talked about free market answers to this, free market answers to that. We've taken on global warming and climate change and uh, large policy issues, and people say there are no free market responses to environmental uh, challenges. There's no way, you know, we've got endangered species, we've got property issues, we've got these things. It's not a free market thing. This is something where the heavy hand of government needs to come in and take care of take care of the environment. If there was ever a need for government, it is to preserve uh, our environmental spaces to make sure our environment's okay. And your organization, you're a bunch of outdoor hippies out there. You're you're <laughs> hanging out in Bozeman. You're up in the woods, and uh, you're always hiking and doing all that other you know enviro stuff that I don't quite understand. So, is there is there a place for the environment and free market economics? Well, I often say to, John, uh, to people, John, that I wouldn't live in Montana if I didn't care about the environment. I wouldn't put up with the winters. Well, you put up with them here, I guess. Uh, yeah, we, we call it free market environmentalism, and, and Perk's mission is to improve environmental quality using property rights and markets. So we're, you know, we start with the environmental quality up front and then say, how can we use property rights and markets, which is what uh, free market environmentalism is about. I can uh, right, most, people, most people right now are listening going, free market environmentalism, they're thinking con. There is no such thing as free market environmentalism and property rights. You have property rights, somebody finds out that there's coal underneath what they're standing on, and their property rights say they can yank out that coal, destroy the world, and you guys who, you know, this, this is obviously some, some sham organization that uh, big industry is, is paying for because there's no such thing. Well, the, to the contrary, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of concrete examples that I think really illustrate how property rights and markets come together with environmental quality. Let me preface this with just one statement that I think captures it all, and it is, no one washes a rental car. If you think about that statement, you really understand why so many of our environmental assets aren't taken care of. A rental car is an asset. It's not taken care of by the renter because the renter doesn't have a stake. Property owners have a stake. We all we know can, what it's like when you buy that first car. You're out there polishing it, you're whoa. waxing it. When you take that rental car out for the first drive, you're in a different town, you see a pothole, you're thinking, I wonder what the suspension on this baby can do because it's not your car. Yeah. Let me give you an example of a, a, a ranch friend uh, who lives near Bozeman, a third generation rancher trying to make ends meet raising cattle has this wonderful spring creek flowing through the property. I fished there for years and years. He always said, sure, come on. Cows are down watering at the stream, doing what they do in streams besides drink. Uh, it's, it was an okay fishery, but not a great one. And I kept saying to him, you know, Tom, you really need to, to improve the stream, and that'll take some resources, but why don't you charge people like myself a little bit? We'll pay to go skiing, we'll pay to play golf, we pay for all these recreational activities, and yours is such a good asset, if you stewarded it just a bit better, you could, you could do well. Fast forward. Tom now has moved the cattle away from the stream, improved the fishery, charges $75 a day. You couldn't get a reservation on that stream for the coming summer, I guarantee you. When asked, how much money do you take in as a percent of total revenue, he says, oh, about 5%. When you ask what's your net profit, from fishing, it's about 80%. He has really changed that stream to an asset that now his cows get to drink out of, but it's really a fishery resource, and those fish migrate into a public river, so everybody benefits in this case. He owns it. It's not a rental car. It's his car. And it's his part of the stream. Wonderful, nice example. Take it out a little bit larger. 
there are environmental needs. There seems to be this battle here in Colorado and it rages across the country of, for instance, energy needs. Uh, we need to get to the oil. We need to get to the rocks. We need to get to the aggregate. We need to get uh, to the coal. And those people saying, no, don't touch it leave it alone, leave it pristine, and in fact what we want to do is buy up this stuff and make it open space. Here in Colorado we are on an open space tear. We cannot get enough open space. My city where I live, Boulder, we own two times our city size in open space. You know, and so we buy this open space and it's not to be touched. Don't use it, don't touch it. Maybe we'll allow some kids to go on it. We'll make a little small part for a dog part so you can run around without your, using a leash. Let's buy it all up because government can steward this land better than you can. And we're talking not just a little stream on, on a ranch. We're talking, you know, most of the state of Colorado is government property. Well, let me, let me give the groups that have uh, pursued some of the open space their due, not the ones that turn it over to government as much. I, I, we've done some research on, on how well uh, these land trusts do. And when it's their money, their donors, them negotiating with the private uh, landowner for conservation easement, they manage it well. And they, they are very careful to work with the private landowner, understanding that that landowner must give her permission before they can even get an easement. And, and what we found in, in looking at land trusts is when, when it's them and an owner, they work well. When that land then gets transferred to public entities, all bets are off. Uh, and I think that's where the problem comes in, and it's because no one owns it now. And we have to depend upon a bureaucracy, a, a, a city council, a county government, so or whatever. So when an organization like the Nature Conservancy comes in and buys in what's called an easement and says, all right, I'm going to pay you not to develop your land. I'm going to pay you, and therefore, it's government's not involved. It's a charitable organization. You're a private property owner. Um, I want you to keep your land the way it is. I'm giving you an incentive to do it. Is that a good model? It's a good model if it's their money or even if it's a donated easement. Many of their easements are donated and to the people who say this isn't a free market purely because there is a tax implication here. But when it's their money or an easement that's being donated, it's a great model because they have to very carefully look at what can we get for this money here versus over there? Can we get it cheaper here and get more of it? I've worked with the Nature Conservancy on some of these kinds of deals, and they're very cognizant of, of not just saying no development, but rather saying maybe we could have a little less development in that corner and a little more development in another corner. Uh, one of my board members has started a company called Conservation Forestry, and he said when he started it, conservation has for too long been the domain of charity. I want to make it the domain of profits. That's profit. what drives sustainability. Well, let me tell you his business model. He goes out, buys, uh, first raises money into a, a, an LLP, a limited partnership, puts, started out raising 50 million, ended up raising closer to 75 million in his first uh, effort, finds a parcel of land being put for sale by, say, International Paper, a company that's liquidated right. much of its land around the country buys large parcels, 250, 300,000. And then he goes to the Nature Conservancy and says, would you like an easement on any of this? My company will get a tax deduction for, for an easement. Uh, you'll help me figure out where the sensitive parts are. Then over there, let's, uh, let's have a trophy home on that little lake that's out there on that. Over here, we're going to have sustainable logging. We can cut trees off this in perpetuity if we take them off at the right speed. Down here, this is so close to the city, let's just put a subdivision in, sell that corner off and make money from it. He's doing very well, thank you, as a venture capitalist who's making a profit, working with a conservation group, mostly the Nature Conservancy. Would he be as others. successful 